As you all know, white Christian nationalism is the greatest threat to our democracy, and Secular AZ is your voice for the separation of religion and government. We are a nonprofit organization, and we act as your voice to elected officials all across the state and at every level. So be sure to check out all of our social media channels, like, subscribe, share. We I just dropped a sub stack this morning. Um, uh, it was just, it's been so long and I've been sick. And so I was like, okay, I need to get something out there. And so hopefully regularly scheduled programming will be up now that I'm feeling a little bit better. Um, we do have incredible programming, including these Friday updates from all kinds of amazing speakers. We have historians, authors, elected officials, journalists, you name it. Uh, next Friday, we are going to be speaking with Dr. Kimberly Mutcherson. She'll be talking about reproductive justice, racism, and the insurrection. So you, again, will not want to miss this. I swear, we have the best programming. And as we get closer to the election, we are going to have the people that you need to hear from to let you know, including the League of Women Voters, who will be talking about the ballot initiatives and referendums. We have uh, Vic Aronow, retired attorney, who uh, is going to be telling us about Vic's picks again this year for your ballot. So stay up to date on what we're uh, talking about here and be sure to tune in every Friday or catch us later if you can't make it. But for today, I am so excited. So this past year in 2023, back in October, I was lucky enough to go to the... Um, uh, Network for Public Education Conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, and while I was there, I met our speaker. Um, Rob Rogers is a committed advocate for the separation of church and state, a recognized expert on the perils of Christian nationalism, and a proud veteran of the U.S. Air Force. His, I, You know what? Can I just say, too, that I love when enlisted people are our biggest champions for separation of church and state. Thank you so much. Um, his activism spans various arenas, including school board oversight, right up our alley, progressive politics, and notably his role as the first vice chair of the El Paso County Colorado Democratic Party. Uh, as a member of organizations like the Freedom From Religion Foundation and American Atheists, Rob, Rob is deeply committed to championing secularism and protecting the rights of non-religious individuals. So welcome, Rob. And is there anything that I missed? I think that's pretty much all. How close are you to Lauren Bo Bobert's district? Just curious. I uh, now that I mean, she's she moved over to Congressional District Four out of Congressional District Three, so that's the northeastern part of Colorado, and I'm more in like the the southern southern central part of Colorado. And has the uh, Bobert crime family um, ever committed any crimes against you or your family? <laughs> just kidding. Sorry. Okay. With, without any further ado, I know that we all just want to hear you speak. So please, I can't wait. Um, and I can't remember, are you going to have, uh, are you going to need to share the screen? Uh, no, I, I, uh, okay. I, I, I elected for us to have a conversation instead. I figured that that would be, uh, that would be better. Great. Uh, fantastic. Well, tell us a little bit first about, you know, how, I, I don't, I don't imagine that you just, you know, you've known since the minute you were born, like, this is the work that I'm going to do. So was there some kind of catalyst that happened that, that kind of pushed you into uh, advocacy work, both when it comes to uh, separation of church and state and just focusing on what's happening on our schools? Because I know that's a passion of yours. Uh, there was, there's probably a couple of different things that happened that led me down this path. The first, I mean, I, I did grow up in an evangelical household in, in uh, Southern Arkansas and went to private Christian schools till I was in ninth grade. Uh, I went to what's called an accelerated Christian education school. So that's one of the places where you're sitting in a learning center in an office. You're like in this cubicle, isolated, working on work in a, in a, a, a packet of information and being taught, you know, a lot of things like uh, humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time and uh, evolution is a, a liberal plot and, you know, those kind of things. I, I grew up in what we would now call, you know, Christian nationalism and then being so that's probably where the the emphasis on public education comes from is uh, just that whole experience and not wanting other kids to go through similar types of things which is what a lot of people are really trying to do uh to our public education system but then after that um i, I still have friends and family in arkansas even though i haven't lived there in a long time and back in 2012 um, i watched the rise of uh, state senator jason rapert in arkansas he was the one that was responsible for putting the Ten Commandments monument on 
state house grounds and prevented the satanic temple from placing, you know, a statue of Baphomet of their own. And uh, I didn't know what I was looking at at the time, but uh, as I learned more about Christian nationalism, uh, the new apostolic reformation uh, as a, a specific example, uh, going back in and look at the news reports and my research from back in the 2012 time frame, I was watching the rise of Christian nationalism then. I just didn't know a name for it. Um, I, I go back now and I see the appeal to heaven flag, the pine tree flag that our new Speaker of the House has sitting outside of his office. And Jason Rapert was using that imagery back then. And one of his mentors was a guy named Dutch Sheets. And I didn't know who that was at the time, but Dutch Sheets is a new apostolic reformation prophet. He he was grooming and bringing Jason Rapert into the fold. And Jason Rapert is now, he's not a state senator anymore, but he started the, um, uh, it's it's called the um, National Association of Christian Lawmakers, which is um, squarely within all of the new apostolic reformation, seven mountains mandate, you know, types of things that are going on now. So that's where I kind of got my start with it from there. Uh, we actually here in Arizona back in 2022 in the House of Representatives on the uh, second floor, there was just one day appeared an appeal to heaven flag. And um, I didn't even I didn't even know what that flag was um, mm -hmm. like. I, and then so so we got this call from uh, a legislator at the time letting us know that the, that it was hung there. And she only knew what it was because she had a neighbor who hung it. And she was like, what the hell is that? And they'd been, you know, hanging Donald Trump flags and stuff like that. So she looked it up and saw what it was and was like, oh, my God, where'd this come from? So we filed a complaint and it kind of disappeared in the middle of the night. But now this year we even have a bill. Uh, I don't even know where that bill is at this point, but there was a bill to allow the appeal to heaven flag uh, to be flown without exception at the, you know, uh, at, at eight HOAs in Arizona. Um so, uh, so how did you get involved with, cause I see that, uh, Lindsay has put up the, uh, dirt road Democrats, uh, your, the, the cause you, you do a, pod a podcast. How did you and Jess Piper connect? Cause Jess was just here, I don't know, about a month ago or so. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've met her through TikTok. Um, I, I, I actually, actually have been kind of neglectful, like, like recently have just busy with things in life right now. But I have gotten quite a bit of attention on TikTok, and and of course, so is she. Um, not um, mine is not nearly the same scale, but we kind of met through TikTok and just comparing notes and doing some basic collaboration on TikTok. And then it uh, the first time that I met her in person was actually at the Network for Public Education conference, and the the organizers of MPE wanted us to sit on a panel together to talk about social media advocacy and using things like TikTok to advocate for public education. So that's really how we how we got started um, kind of working together. And, and then um, we've, we've discovered some things that we have in common. Um, you know, but both of us, I mean, if you listen to the podcast, both of us uh, experience, you know, the, the religious trauma uh, associated with growing up in the types of households that we did in the, in the South. So as an example, watching shiny, happy people about the Duggar family, um, the people that grew up in that, in that world have a very, very different take on on what what you were showing I mean, a lot of people would look at that as like oh, that's just crazy you know i can't believe this was happening and i had to like stop it a couple of times because i'm like i don't know if i can watch this again um just a reliving some of those memories but that's that's how we got to know each other we were we were also running uh we, we were running for um state representative positions me in colorado and her in missouri uh, at the same time too so we had connected over that experience we we're both first-time candidates at the same time running in uh, very red areas. So we were able to commiserate over that too. That, yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, what were the margins for the legislative district where you ran in Colorado? Like how, how, how plus and minus was it Republican Democrat? I, it's, it's, uh, I, I was running in, in the reddest, the reddest house district in El Paso County. Um, so it, it was, uh, really, really large margins, you know, plus, plus 20, plus 22, something like that. Uh, Republican, but um, and, I, I, I had a, I had a goal. I mean, I knew that just you you can't really argue with numbers. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there there's it's just the way that it is. But I wanted to put a dent in the I wanted to put a dent in their progress, and I got to a sixty forty split um, the for the first time in this district ever, and that was from a from an open atheist uh, running in the same district where Focus on the Family is and where New Life Church is and. 
Uh, a lot of the Christian nationalist churches that I've done church planting here in El Paso County, um, I, that was that was a district I was running in. So I, I'll take that as a win. And and also, you know, I just have so much admiration for people like you and like Jess. And we have a, a handful of them here in Arizona, too, that year after year, or, you know, cycle after cycle, they'll run in these red districts because otherwise folks in those red districts and red country counties, they don't have anybody to choose from. Uh, you know, it's got to be such a frustrating experience. So thanks so much, really, for for running. I mean, essentially running to lose. But like you said, you moved the needle. Um can you maybe share, uh, do you have any examples perhaps? Because uh, I love when Jess talks about her um, interactions with folks as she's, you know, on the campaign trail or just talking about vouchers and funding schools. Do you have any examples, anecdotes of interactions with folks where you actually were able to maybe get them to see things from a different perspective? Because I feel like we're all frustrated that we're so divided and how do we even relate to people? There's the, there's one that I always think of um, because see I, I I go to these places I go to the churches um, you know to to hear what it is that they're saying and but also just kind of to send a message to that I'm not afraid of you um, this isn't anything that I haven't heard before and it's you're not going to intimidate me so I go and there was one uh, one particular um, time there was a there's a, a Colorado state representative her name is Stephanie Luck. Um, she came, she, she, she is a Christian nationalist. She is a promoter of the seven mountains mandate. And she does these private tours where she calls it under the golden dome. Cause the, the Capitol building in Denver is a, is a gold dome. And she comes and she talks to these churches about the things that have been going on. And, and she talks about it in a very breathless way, you know, the, just the crazy things that liberals are doing and that kind of thing. But, but I went, she was speaking at a, a church that was, uh, here and I went that night and, I, I think that people were surprised that I that I made the effort and, you know, that I was there and, you know, I, I was trying to be like as respectful as I could. Uh, but it was at that church and someone someone started they started the conversation very confrontational. And I said, it's like, look, you know, it's this is one of the things that we're just not going to agree on. You know, I, I, I am an atheist. I've been an atheist for a long time. I don't believe that religious belief of any type belongs in secular government. So we're not going to agree on that. We just aren't. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to represent you in the best way that I can, because that's my job as a representative. That's what I have to do. I have to figure out how to set aside as much as I can my own personal beliefs, my own personal feelings about things. And I have to represent the constituents and I have to meet them where, where they're at. So let's not talk about that. Let's not talk about the whether or not I believe in God, because that has nothing to do with the job. Let's talk about some of the problems that you have. What is going on like in your life right now that you think that I might be able to help with? And she told me a story about how she had just uh, retired from uh, from a police force and she was having all of these problems with her taxes uh, based on the fact that she was given lump sum payments as part of her uh, retirement plan. And it was very confusing. She couldn't get any answers from like the state level. She couldn't get any answers from the federal level. And as she was walking me through that, I was like, okay, this is something that we can talk about. And this is something I might be able to help you with because there is there, some of this is being caused by state law. And if the law was changed in like X, Y, and Z ways, then, you know, it would help you, you know, now, and it could also help you like in the future. And I've also got some context in certain places. I'll give them a call and see if they can, you know, get in touch with you directly and, and uh, see if they can help you out. So it's really, really mundane, right? It, that's a very, it, it, well, it's mundane for to hear about it, but it wasn't mundane for her because this was the, the, the taxes that were being withheld from her um, retirement plan was causing her and her husband like some serious difficulties. So it's those types of things that I always had some success redirecting the conversation towards real things that are actually happening to people. And redirecting them away from things that we're just not going to agree with. But not only that, it's not relevant. Um, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be any more appropriate for me to stand up as an elected official and say there is no God than it would be for me to stand up and say everybody needs to worship the Christian God. They, neither one of those things are appropriate in secular government. They're they're not relevant. So you, I, I don't talk about those things. I told people from the very beginning that I'll compromise on a whole lot of things. I won't compromise on human rights. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, that I, I will not compromise on everyone having equal and equitable rights. I'm not not going to do it. But everything else is on the table. Let's talk about it. 
And that seemed to resonate with a lot of people. And I have to think that's one of the reasons that I was able to make the progress that I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, and it's, it, and it's really difficult, I feel, to get those folks to engage in our shared reality. Um, I mean, like we can see examples of that with like, you know, Walter Masterson and, and the guys that go and troll all these Trump rallies were like, tell us how, um, you know, illegal immigration has affected you personally. And they're like, I, I can't do it because I live in North Dakota or whatever, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's actually an interesting point, too, though, and also something I tried to stay away from because we, we do spend so much time talking about the, the hypocrisy there. And it's really easy to 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 be a troll and to trap them in these hypocritical statements, but we're forgetting the fact that the hypocrisy is the point. The they they know that it's hypocritical. They especially like the leadership. They they know this already. And the the hypocrisy is actually a signal that if you're part of the club and the rules don't apply to you, they do this kind of thing on purpose, and they know that they're doing it. And it's also a distraction for us with taking the time to gather the information to point out the hypocrisy. It hasn't really done anything. We spent a lot of time doing that. It doesn't really, you know, make any kind of like an impact. So I always try to like redirect people into the things that we do have in common. I I do love the idea. Uh, and, I, I you know, I, I also ran. I ran in 2020 for countywide seat here in Maricopa County. Um, and then I ran in 2022 for state Senate in a, a turning purple district, I guess, in North Phoenix. Um, and it was interesting because. There were some people when I was knocking doors where I could say like, what, you know, what is the number one issue that you're facing? And when they would give me a serious answer, it, we would have great conversations and it might take me a long time. I'm sure that my organizers and campaign managers got tired of me because it would take me so long sometimes to knock on doors. But those conversations at the doors are really important. Now, I also had a fair amount of people who I could tell immediately, like, this is not going to be a conversation that is at all grounded in reality. Um, and I try to get out of there as quickly as I can. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, canvassing, good times, but important. And clearly you you knocked on enough doors to have that kind of a margin. Um, there's an ask here from Jude. She says, how do teachers respond? And have you had conversations with teachers who don't support or care about church state separation? I, I haven't had any conversations with teachers that don't care about this. I mean, generally, all of my experience with talking to educators, um, most of the educators like in the public education system that I have had conversations with, they understand why it's necessary. Um, so I, I, I haven't had too many conversations with, with teachers about that. Um, they all seem to understand and uh, value the fact that of why that kind of thing shouldn't be included in a public education system. Um, the And the ones that, I, I mean, I, and this is just me personally, I haven't had any conversations with, with people like that. I know that they exist and uh, you see them moving out of the public education system and, you know, they're uh, moving into the charter system or into the private schools, that kind of thing. But I haven't had, I, I cannot remember having any conversations with teachers who don't care about that. So, you know, as you know, uh, Arizona is uh, a petri dish of, of bad ideas when it comes to public education. In fact, I think if she's not back yet, she was out of town recently to Tennessee, Beth Lewis, who heads up Save Our Schools, Arizona, to tell them, you know, to warn at the state legislature, hey, don't do this. Um, so uh, what is the status of uh, uh, vouchers or as as they call them here in Arizona, ESAs in the state of Colorado? Um, I, I, I have not heard of any of the school districts implementing ESAs yet. Now, in my in my local school district, um, they did pop up recently when we 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 did not fare well during the school board elections back this previous November. Um, all of the the largest school districts in uh, the Colorado Springs and El Paso County area, they've all been taken over uh, either, either majorities or unanimous majorities of the extremists. Um, and it didn't take very long in my local school district. They, um, the, the board president uh, started talking about, and they've, of course, they're discussing these things in executive session for some reason. Um, but they started talking about ESAs 
And what it appears that they're trying to do, and this is something for everybody to look out for, what they are appearing to do is they're trying to tie this to special education. So it's it's difficult to find special education teachers and paras. Uh, it's it's difficult to find teachers in general um, in in Colorado. Colorado is uh, it's either the uh, second second or the um, the state that pays the least um, uh, teacher salaries. Um, so it's difficult in general. But the board president seems to be going down a path of trying to justify ESAs by tying it to special education. Your uh, special needs kids are not getting what they need in uh, the public school system. So here's ESA program so you can get them out into a, a private school. But there aren't any private schools in El Paso County or in, in you know driving distance either that would be able to service those students either. So you already kind of like see the grift coming. Um, it's setting up an opportunity for for the friends and colleagues of anti-public education uh, people to to set up their own to take advantage of those kind of things. So it's a it, it's a red herring. It, it's a way of just getting the ball started. Now, I, as far as I know, I mean, as soon as a lot of us saw that ESAs were starting to be mentioned, obviously we sounded the alarm, and it seems as if that's been tabled for now. But um, yeah, it's a there's been some attempts in Colorado, but because of the way the Colorado Constitution is written, um, that would be it would be very difficult to do something like that. And there hasn't been any that have been successful so far. But we're we're watching out. We have we have different issues in Colorado once again because of the way that the state constitution is written. Um, there there is no higher authority than a local school board. Uh, even our state Department of Education, they have no authority over local school boards. Because local control is given to school boards by de by definition, by design in the Constitution. But that's also something for everyone to, to, to be aware of, too, that Colorado is being used as an example. It's being used as a test case for a lot of these anti-public education and Christian nationalist things because we're a home rule state and we're backwards than a lot of other states are. So, but they're not going to inform people about that. They're going to use those loopholes and that those local control concepts to get to have successes that they can then crow about to the rest of the country, while not pointing out that it was a whole lot easier for them to do that in Colorado than it would have been anywhere else. Um, and you know, vouchers and and uh, charter schools are are a couple of those things that they'll be crowing about their successes if you just turn over your school boards to good Christian conservatives like us, then you can see these successes too without pointing out that it's a whole lot easier to do that here than is other places. Yeah. Wow. That's, I did not realize that that was how, um, the, how education, public education was set up where the, the school board has the final say, um, you know, are the, and we're a nonpartisan organization, obviously we fight evangelical extremism, but we know which party tends to be more extreme in their evangelicism. Um, uh, and so, you know, just thinking about that, it used to be in Arizona that they would tout and, and proclaim, you know, we care about local control. No, they don't. Um, at every opportunity over the last several many years, they've taken away uh, a school district's autonomy to be able to make their own decisions. Um, and in fact, there's a couple of people here, too, that pointed out that Starting with special needs kids is exactly how we started in Arizona. It's it's how they tip their they dip their toes in the water and and you know it's valid like you said there's a shortage right of of teachers who teach uh, special ed students, um you know the needs of our special ed students are are probably more complicated now than they than they have been in the past with regards to some of the I guess things that could be distractions in the classroom. Um, and so that's how they got their foot in the door here in Arizona. And now, now that we've gone from, you know, a handful of parents that had to be very specific about the needs of their children to everybody, absolutely everybody, regardless of their income. Now, guess who's being just completely cast aside uh, with regards to our ESAs? It's our kids with special needs. They never mm -hmm. cared about them in the first place. They used them as an opportunity to expand their privatization efforts. And in our state, of course, probably like most other states, we have so many elected officials who have gotten rich on the privatization of our schools, whether it's through charter schools, uh, clearing houses to handle the money, um, it, it becoming uh, vendors, uh, which by the way, like the vendors, 
that are approved by the Department of Education, like we don't even know who they are. We can't even get access to who those vendors are. And in fact, there was uh, a vendor right at the beginning, I think of, or right after the election, sure enough, we found out that he had been abusing kids and listed as a vendor. There's no safety nets for the families who use these funds anymore. It's It's gotten really bad. Um, here's another question. This one's coming from Jay. Colorado passed a medical aid and dying bill in 2016. Has this law been challenged? Do you happen to know that? Yeah, that's there. There's a uh, this Colorado has a trifecta. Um, all the all the different branches of the government are, and the, all the statewide offices are all controlled by Democrats, and uh, along with the state house and the state senate. And so there's a ever since that happened, there's a series of bills that will that are kind of, you know, the, these perennial bills that will get brought up, you know, trying to outlaw abortion or trying to outlaw um, um, the dying with dignity uh, laws that we have like in the state. And they're they're challenged, you know, every year there's new new legislation that is uh, that is brought forward to uh, to reverse uh, the progress that, you know, that's been made and they always get defeated um, that dying with dignity bill as far as i'm aware has not been challenged in court though either so um it seems it appears to be uh, uh perfectly solid for now but, but yeah our uh that it has not been enshrined we uh, colorado has a, a ballot initiative that's uh, being pursued right now to uh put a right to abortion in our state constitution uh, that'll be voted on should be voted on in november um but um, as soon as after, it was very, very shortly after Roe versus Wade was overturned, the Colorado uh, legislators implemented a bill that basically um, made that the law in Colorado. We just had we got one more step to go for that to be enshrined in the Constitution. So there, there are a lot of protections that are in place for various people within uh, Colorado, and they get challenged, but they, they don't make any progress. Uh, that's great. Um, I mean, it's great that that we can maybe look to Colorado <laughs> and maybe be like, okay, maybe we can have nice things too. I'm still stuck on this idea that, that it's your school boards though, that have the ultimate say so. But now that I think about it in a way here in Arizona, I would argue that probably our local school boards, I mean, our, our rural school boards, they, they don't have to answer to anybody, <laughs> you know, in places like Benson, Arizona or St. John's um, where it's, very much a majority of LDS families or Colorado City, uh, where the FLDS families are. And we know for sure that they're taking uh, advantage. They're one of the outliers because it's mostly wealthy people who are taking advantage of these vouchers. But Colorado City, not only do they have child brides um, who are forced uh, into marriage at an early age and having children themselves so they can double dip on the whole voucher scene up there. It's a... Uh, there's it's there's a... The whole, whole home rule, home rule concept. I think there's six states that um, their their government works backwards from most other states because usually it's kind of like a top down thing, where the state organizations then push down, you know, control and policy regulations down to the cities, municipalities, and counties. In a home rule state, it works the exactly the opposite. Um, and most and all those states are in, are western states, and there are some very practical reasons why. You need that because, I mean, most of Colorado, the vast majority of Colorado is very rural. Um, the the front range from Fort Collins down to Pueblo, that's where majority of the people reside. But most of Colorado from a landmass perspective is, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. So there's some practical reasons why those kind of things need to happen. Um, but that also opens the doors for people to take advantage of it, too. Mm hmm. So let's let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about uh, TikTok because I love uh, your TikTok channel and I I want to know first of all like and we even talked about it I talked about it with you and Jess when we were all in DC and how like I was nervous about it and you were like just say what you want you know so like I want to talk a little bit about how you and so I have I took your advice just so you know and it's really just videos of me being angry about things and it's more for my own therapy honestly than to to I, like I'm not looking to go viral and I'm certainly not going viral or anything like that but in a way it's definitely helped me so I want to know how you um you know was it a strategic move where you're like okay I gotta get on this TikTok thing or were you just like um 
Uh, like, how did it come about? And then how did you gain confidence? And how did you get so many followers and have so many videos that have gone viral? Uh, I did not want to do it. I, I was I did not want anything to do with it. And it was when it's when I was running for I was when I was running for office and all of my all my campaign team were women. And and women have a different perspective on how to interact with the public. And they all recognized that TikTok was something, you know, that, that politicians had been successful with, that it was getting um, a lot of traction, a lot of views. And so they kind of like made me do it. And it was really awkward and it was really horrible and I hated it at the at the beginning. But it was it was also very valuable too because it just helped me get over myself uh, in a lot of ways. It's it's hard putting yourself out there, especially on video. And but it was it was also very valuable of of doing that and learning how to do it and learning how to do it well because it translates into a lot of different ways. It it just made me more comfortable with putting myself out there and being able to inform people. Um, so I, I hated it, but I'm glad that I did it. And I've, I've made a lot of friends um, through TikTok as well. I mean, I mean, just, just being one of them, but there's a lot of people that I collaborate with and work with. Um, and then, but then after, after the campaign was over with, I'm like, okay, I kind of got these followers here. You know, what do I do with this? And there were so many things that people just weren't talking about. They, people were not talking about Christian nationalism the way that they are now. People were not talking about the new apostolic reformation. They didn't know the names of these people who are actually um, controlling so much of what we see happening across the country. I'm like, all right, so maybe maybe I could do something there, but but I've got to figure out how to explain these really complex concepts in short form. So that's also where I found it valuable because it forced me down a path of of how do I adopt what Neil deGrasse Tyson does. For science and how do I how do I shift that into explaining what Christian nationalism is? Because these these networks are vast and they've been operating unchecked for since the 1970s. How do I explain this? So it it, it forced me into distilling and figuring out how to explain these complex things in short form. And I think that's also been valuable too. Um, I mean, I, I I know that I know that people have learned from what I've put out there. Um, because I can I can see it being repeated and I can see it spreading. So, um, but people may not know just how much research and time goes into each one of those things either. Um, I mean, it's it's hours, and 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 I'm not I'm not doing it by myself either. You know, there's there's several people that are helping with doing the research and figuring out how to how to how to distill these things down. And you know, there there's people that I work with. You know, where I will promote their work and they'll promote mine in order to you know, trigger algorithms to get it spread in other places. There's a lot of work that goes into it, but I, it ultimately it's also been worth it from a lot of different perspectives. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of your videos, uh, I, I, you, your video about the marching band, um, about the marching band that had, what was it a whole, like, it was like a tent revival uh, it was a great marching band show. <laughs> I, I grew up yeah. in a small, I grew up in a small town in Illinois, Marengo, Illinois, uh, Marengo Community High School. We were always in our division. We had like the number one band, like marching band. So I can really dig a good marching band show. But watching your video of it, and it's literally, I mean, just can you maybe describe it a little bit? Because I was absolutely blown away. Was that in Arkansas, that marching band? Yeah, it was in Lake Hamilton, Arkansas. It's one of the reasons why I got my attention. And the, my friends in Arkansas, like, have you seen this? So it's, a. Uh, um, I guessed, the, the, the story is that they based it on uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And the old tent revivals back in the Depression era. era. And it, it's it's difficult to even just, I mean, it was, it's very surreal watching it because they, they come like marching out and they've got a sign you know, that they're, they're holding that's, uh, you know, you, you, sinners go to hell and you need to repent and that kind of thing, like old school, like tent revival things. And, and just knowing that it was like high school kids and also knowing that, I mean, I used to be a teenager, a high schooler in Arkansas and that didn't agree with a lot of the things that were like happening. And this is what you have to participate in in order to be in this marching band that, that was, that was competing at the national level. They are very talented, and I pointed that out, you know, in in the TikTok too. But the the and then watching the response of the the parents and the other people in like Hamilton, 
who were talking about the, the opportunities that God gave this marching band to spread the gospel kind of thing and to spread spread that message. Like there's so many things that are wrong with this, regardless of whether or not they're talented, not taking anything away from their talent, regardless of that, there's something wrong here. And it was, uh, uh, yeah, it, it was very surreal watching that. And then, and then watching the people like come to the defense of it too, was also just very strange. Yeah. And then I think uh, because of your video and your commentary about it, it was uh, Hemant Mehta, the friendly atheist who then picked up on it. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I go to you for TikTok and, and I wake up every morning with uh, Hemant and the Arizona Agenda Substack. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, you know, everybody knows what I'm doing uh, in the morning. Um, so there is a comment in here that is really exciting. Um, Claudia is saying that here in the Verde Valley, because Arizona is the, the same, we are rural. You know, um, there's a joke here outside of Maricopa County. There's this little place called Arizona, right? Like we've got we've got Phoenix and the metropolitan area here, metro, which is basically Maricopa County. And we've got Tucson. Uh, Flagstaff is actually a very tiny town. It's college town. So like uh, we are extremely rural. And when I think about the things that happen in these rural communities, like, for example, Pinal County, which is between Maricopa and Pima County, very rural, very red, very racist, just saying. And I know the folks who live in Pinal County who are here right now are none of those, you know, like, so, but they, um, they have a county superintendent there who, uh, and school districts there that don't even have elections because nobody's running. So the county superintendent, just appoints people and the more MAGA, the better, which is another reason why those county superintendent seats are so important because here in Arizona, if there's a vacancy, a vacancy on any board and we're weird too, because Maricopa County has 58 districts instead of one large unified disti district and the entire state has 300 ish. Um, so when, you know, so when there's a vacancy, those county superintendents have a lot of power in determining who gets on those boards. And in one of those rural districts, I want to say it was, it's called like the Colorado River District or something, probably near Kingman or somewhere in Arizona. Um, they just adopted PragerU as their official curriculum. Like it's not just, and by the way, our state superintendent has also touted PragerU as, and putting links on our government websites you know, promoting PragerU and encouraging people to use their garbage curriculum. Um, all this to get to the comment that I have in Verde Valley from Claudia. They have started the recall of Misty Cox of the Mingus Union High School District. Uh, we hope to have the first successful recall of a school board member. Well, good luck, Claudia, because it's probably one of the hardest. I know here in Maricopa County, I don't think there's ever been a successful recall, but I know too that in those rural districts and rural counties, when you are passionate about something and you are in a sea of red, it's amazing what those folks will get done. So I have faith in you, Claudia, and everybody else there working on that recall. Um, okay, question about Colorado related to home rule, maybe. I'm, I don't know what that means. If you could clarify, James. Okay, and we got a couple other here. Um, Ducks is asking, what do you expect the Christo fascist in the Arizona legislature will try next after their respect uh, bill failed to pass? So this is a little bit of insider baseball here. Um, but the Respect Act was re reject escalating Satanism by preserving essential core traditions. I'm sorry. I laugh yeah, I every saw, time. <laughs> I saw I, I saw some the some of the, the uh, testimony that some of the TST members in Phoenix were given about that. Yeah, and we did actually, uh, we clipped it. So there's a there's a YouTube uh, 30 minute video that's clipped. So you don't have to watch the whole entire committee hearing, but the entire committee hearing was awful. Um, and that part was especially terrible. And the way that the folks were treated was really, really bad. And thankfully we do have one um, Republican Senator, Ken Bennett, who lives in LD1, which is the Prescott area who, you know, utilizes crocodile tears a lot of times to, you know, vote in, in a really bigoted and discriminatory way. But he at least uh, every once in a while will stand up and, and say, I'm going to not vote against that uh, or I'm going to vote or, against that. Yeah. 
and more specifically to like the answer to the question, <clears throat> because my answer there is going to be more broad, you know, and kind of apply to the entire nation is if you read that bill and you heard uh, your legislator who was promoting it, you heard him speak about it. It's blatantly discriminatory. He's blatantly discriminating against a IRS recognized valid religion. And which is also blatantly unconstitutional. There's there's no there's no two ways about that. That if that bill were to become law, it would have been challenged. Um, it, it, it probably, I mean, it probably would have been held unconstitutional at much lower levels and get in the Supreme Court. So everybody knows this. So why are they doing it? Why would they be promoting a bill that is blatantly unconstitutional, blatantly discriminatory on its face? In the title of the bill, it's discriminatory. Why are they doing it? Well, that's because they want to get sued. You, you, you'll see this you know, in several different circumstances. The Christian nationalists want to get sued. I mean, there, uh, Kelly Shackelford, who runs uh, um, uh, First Liberty, which is kind of a legal organization, kind of like uh, Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, he's talked about this with a group of pastors. There's a, there's a video of him talking to a group of pastors down in New Orleans maybe two or three years ago where he's describing this, uh, where he wants the pastors to get sued. He wants them to be pushing the envelopes uh, so they can – what they're trying to do is to get these water watershed cases to the SCOTUS, to, to the Supreme Court level because right now the Supreme Court is friendly and would probably overturn decades of precedent. They're really, really looking for this this uh, this precedent that's going to overturn, um, you know, things like uh, 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 separation of church and state and the definitions of that and how the Supreme Court has traditionally interpreted those things. They're looking for those things to be overturned. Well, in order for those things to get overturned, they got to have cases. So they want these things to be challenged, and that 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 should change all of our thinking and our tactics about this too. Because the legal system is not necessarily going to work in our favor the way that it used to once it gets up to that level. So it's it's something to keep in, in mind and keep keep in consideration. And it's, you know, the thing that Andrew Seidel brings up. Well, he fully believes that we, you know, that the arc of history bends towards justice and that, you know, we are entering into an age of enlightenment and that they are loud, but we are many, all that kind of stuff. He says, yeah, but the courts. Right. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's his fear is the courts and it should be all of our fear. In fact, here in Arizona, we've got a board member who was reading scripture. Um, you know, we filed, uh, you know, we sent a complaint. Freedom from religion sent a complaint. Um, you know, First Liberty Legal picked her up and then she decided to sue the district that she's supposed to be serving. Um, you know, and you're right. All of these bills are designed to keep pushing through the court system and and these folks are absolutely emboldened and and because and I just want to really give a shout out to our legal team here at Secular AZ because we really are the only group that is that is filing these kinds of complaints and sending these letters um you know and citing the court cases and we are showing up at school board meetings and at the legislature to to defend the separation of church and state, but it's exhausting. We're tiny. We're like a tiny little organization. But I, I do want to give a shout out because our legal department, we just found out a couple of days ago, my phone blew up immediately because a local school district here, the Paradise Valley Unified School District, uh, like four people reached out to me once the agenda dropped and they said, hey, have you seen this? And it was a memorandum of understanding, an MOU with the LDS church to allow missionaries into the public schools in the Paradise Valley School District to do service learning. And one very well-written letter from our attorney and it was removed. So like we need to be, but just think about him, how many of those MOUs in the 300 school districts in Arizona are already in place? Or like here, it made national news, Rob, about the Washington Elementary School District and the Arizona Christian University. Um, a board member was like, wow, their statement of faith is really discriminatory and bigoted. You know, marriage is only between a man and a woman. Uh, homosexuality is an abomination in the eyes of God. Well, Alliance Defending Freedom came in and scared the heck out of that small district. And what did they do? They continued their MOU. So we need people with backbones too on these school boards to stand up 
to the bullies and the bigots who have deep pockets to take these cases because we're tiny. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. There is a question here from James. He says, I heard that there is an area in Northeast Colorado that is a MAGA refuge. I mean, I miss it just just about everywhere outside of like the front range. If you if you look at a map and you run, you, you just run your finger, you know, from Fort Collins down to Pueblo, those areas, you know, there with the exception of, you know, Colorado Springs, um, that's that's where you're going to find the more um, more progressive thinking people. You know, it's larger cities and that kind of thing outside of outside of the front range. You're going to see it's going to be a lot more red. You're going to see a lot more of like the MAGA, you know, kind of like area. Maybe you're probably like talking about Weld County and those kind of areas, Arapahoe County areas, like up in the northeast part of Colorado, and, and it probably is. Um, El Paso County, where I live, is uh, the largest um, Republican stronghold um, in in the United States in terms of uh, the the number the number of people and the number of Republicans. Um, one one of the larger larger strongholds, uh, but a lot of people don't also don't know too that all of the things that you see from a Christian nationalist perspective uh, that are going on nationwide, it's all being organized here, either here or right next door in Teller County in Woodland Park, Colorado. Uh, we are the epicenter of of this of the Seven Mountains Mandate, the New Apostolic Reformation. All of that is happening uh, right in this area and being distributed from here, primarily by a guy named Andrew Womack and. Uh, who runs Karis Bible College and his political organization is called Truth and Liberty uh, Coalition. Um, it's all all starts and all happens here. And a lot of the leadership is actually here too. I feel like we maybe even had a speaker um, a while back, maybe a year, more than a year ago, talking about uh, Colorado specifically and how it plays into the Christian nationalist scene. Um, mm -hmm. We have Ravon Bowens here, who is, um, who is who just started a chapter in Sholo, like the Pine Top Sholo area, which is another very rural area. And she points out the largest Trump store is in Sholo. <laughs> I've driven by it. It's sad. It makes me sad. Um, let's see. I thought I missed another question here. But yeah, I mean, oh, here we go. Another power of Arizona and Alaska and Connecticut. This one's coming from Ravon. Uh, she says public school authorities, firearms, anyone with permission from school authority. Uh, I think I know what you're talking like. I heard this recently, and I, I think it may have even been you, Ravon, that told me that, that that the that superintendents on or or principals on campuses, I, there's something about them being being able to carry firearms or they can designate areas in schools where the firearms are kept. And I, again, I don't remember who told me that. And if you want to clarify, Ravon, please do, because I just heard about this recently. So um, let's go back to Rob though real quick. So um, are you thinking about running in the future? Um, I, I probably, I probably like wouldn't, wouldn't be able to escape it. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I will likely run for something in, in the future again. Um, I, I don't know that it would be like at the first state legislator, um, to be honest. Uh, once again, there's because of like home rule and because of um, because of how the Colorado Constitution and the government is structured. I don't know that it'd be able to like make as much of an impact as uh, as, as I would want, um, you know, there. But, you know, I I've, I've thought about like some other things. Um, that uh, may be coming up over like the next couple of years. Well, that's the best, I mean, the, the best that I can tell you, like right now. But I've also, I've also kind of like been shifting, um, shifting towards uh, campaign management, um, specifically from a from a messaging, and all my professional background is from a data analytics perspective. So I've I've been shifting, you know, kind of like in that direction too. That maybe maybe instead of like running for public office um because there's plenty of old white guys who who are in elected pos uh, positions of power uh maybe i could shift that focus and use my skills to support women and people of color you know taking uh, a more prominent role um in those kinds of positions too maybe that's maybe that's the way i should go mm -hmm. um so well i hope i you know i I hope that you stay in it at whatever capacity, because I think that your ability to communicate really difficult um, concepts to people is just so, so strong. I, I just really appreciate you and the work that you do. 
And again, what is it? Your 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 um TikTok is like bro Rogers or something like that. <laughs> yeah, well, sure like you... that's, that's a story too, because I <laughs> set up like all of my social media accounts, you know, when I was running for office and I set it up as elect Rob Rogers. It's all one word, elect Rob Rogers. And it wasn't until I had done all of the work to sell this up that, you know, it can easily be read as electro brogers. Um, so you won't forget it. You won't forget it like either way, whether you remember elect Rob Rogers or electro brogers. But I actually created a comic book character uh, called electro brogers that I used in my campaign material. So I just leaned into the oversight. Oh, my gosh. That is so cool. Um, well, so. I don't see any more questions. Just a lot of thank you uh, for, for coming. Thanks. It was a great talk, et cetera. Um, so I try to end because sometimes when we talk about issues here, uh, especially when the underlying topic is almost always white Christian nationalism, um, like it's hard to find hope, especially on a Friday afternoon. Um, so, so what's something in these trying times, Rob, that gives you hope? I, I, I felt more hopeful. It was, it was last December, um, at, um, oh man, his name, his name escaped me. Uh, he's a democratic strategist that worked for Hillary Clinton. He lives down in, uh, lives in New Orleans. I cannot think of his name just like left my head. Um, <laughs> I, I'll think of it like here in a minute, but there's a, um, a, a democratic strategist. He's a bald, bald head, um, speaks, you know, very plainly about things. And I can't remember. James Carville, it's, thank you. Somebody, okay. somebody in the uh, somebody in the chat. James Carville, <laughs> I was more hopeful back in November, December of 2023. Whenever James Carville, it, it's as soon as Mike Johnson ended up taking uh, the Speaker of the House position, uh, James Carville started talking about Christian nationalism, and he and he didn't he didn't use the code words. He didn't try to like dance around it. James Carville, who is probably the most prolific Democratic strategist of our time is coming out and saying it full-throated. Christian nationalism is the largest threat that the United States has ever faced. And for someone like him, with his media presence, with his contacts coming out and saying that as directly as he is, <clears throat> it made it so much easier for me because now I've got someone with that level of credibility who is also saying the same things that I've been saying for the last three years. And then once he opened those floodgates, now we're starting to see the major media sources also referring to this and talking about this directly. So it, it opened up so many doors for all of the journalists and researchers that have been talking about this for so long. That that gives me hope that now it's no longer uh, taboo to, to, to talk about these things more directly and the threat that it's actually facing. Now, that, that, may, that may seem a little weird way of describing what makes me hopeful. But it's so important because Christian nationalism has gone unchecked since the end. The United States has, hasn't really had a threat except for Christian nationalism since the end of World War II because all of these things have been in plan, uh, planned and in place since the 1970s, and no one has ever stood in their path. There's, it's gone completely unchecked for this long, which is how uh, we see a minority of the United States controlling things now from a Christian nationalist perspective. So it does give me a lot of hope that there are finally now large and major media sources that are talking about this directly uh, because it's going to make it easier for all of us. So that that does that does make me hopeful. Um, and, and along with that, the vast majority of Americans reject that ide ideology. Uh, it's just this very loud majority that's making themselves appear to be much larger than they are. It isn't real. It's fake. It's an illusion. Uh, we are the majority. The people like us uh, are the majority. And we just now have to take our position and people like James Carville are making that space for us. Yeah, I agree. I started, um, you know, I have a Google alert that I've had for the past three years or so about Christian nationalism and where it would be like one or two things here and there, you know, every day, every other day, maybe now it's like half a dozen to a dozen every single day. So it's, mm -hmm. it's out there on mainstream media um, also they're using it and embracing the term as if it's not terrifying, which I find just so bizarre, but whatever. Um, that's great. And I appreciate that. So, so let's all have a wonderful weekend. Yes. We got to get out the vote. Yes. We got to stand behind good candidates. Yes. We got to get signatures for the abortion for access for all, uh, initiative, which will very likely be on our ballot as well. Thank goodness. Um, 
And I just want everybody to remember today that you have to vote because yesterday when Governor Hobbs was talking about enshrining uh, you know, people's rights, their their access to birth control, Senator Sonny Borelli uh, said that women need to use aspirin as birth control. Just put it between their legs, hold it on their knees. So that's who we've got representing us in Arizona. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in Tucson. Thanks so much, Rob. I appreciate you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for everything that you do too. It, it isn't easy like doing what you're doing. You already mentioned you're a small organization and you, I mean, you, you guys are loud, you know, for being, a, you know, for being rel relatively small and you're doing a lot of good work and just uh, keep it up. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate that. All right. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend and we'll see you next Friday. Bye, everybody. Thanks for having me.